outside waiting for this earth after the church is raptured out. But you know what? I'm just so excited about the possibility it could be at any moment. And I'm just looking forward to that time I hear that shout from glory and that trump of God sound. It's good to be here in the house of God again tonight. It's also good to know that God is here. And if you haven't felt His presence, it's not because God is not here. It's because something is hindering you somewhere in your life. You need to check up and get that taken care of. But if you will, please, and I turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter number 19. The book of Acts, chapter number 19, and I'd like to begin reading tonight with verse number 8. I'll give you a few moments to find your places in the precious Word of God. What would you say that tonight is the most evilest place on the planet Earth? What would you say that might be? North Korea. I agree. North Korea is a terrible place. But not anywhere else. What would you say the evilest place in the world is tonight? Where are you here? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. That really is. Well, anywhere else. All over the world, there's a lot of evilness, especially in this day and time in which we're living. But all those that you have mentioned are certainly true. But if God was to call you to go to one of those places, do you think there's hope for any of those places? Do you think there's a way that things can be changed from the evil situation that is there in a lot of places all over the world? Those places in Burlington, a lot of you wouldn't want to go to. There's some places in Burlington I wouldn't want to go to. There's a lot of places up in Greensboro I wouldn't want to go to. And there's a lot of evilness all around us. But what if God would call us to go? Would you act more like Jonah or would you surrender and go automatically to where God wants you to go? What I hear in this passage of Scripture is on his third missionary journey. Paul's been used of God greatly throughout his life. Now God has called Paul to go to one of the evilest places on earth. But you know that God was able to use Paul in such a way that he reached many souls there in this area. And the way that God used Paul to reach these souls for Jesus evil place is the same way that God reaches people today. You might think where you work people, I maybe think that. I don't know. That. But wherever it is that you might be, wherever God has got you, I want to tell you in this passage of Scripture tonight, you're going to find out how that God can use you. If you are a child of God, He can use you to reach that place. And that place can be turned to the glory of God. You will please now stand with me, those of you that are able to have a you. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning with verse number 8, and went into the synagogue. Now, the synagogue is where the Jewish people gathered together and worship. He went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing, persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing uh, daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one Sabbath, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. 
Many of them also which use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them, and found that 50,000 pieces of silver so mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Our Heavenly Father, if there's ever been a time that we need this type of situation to take place, we're living in that day. And God, if you can do such a thing as this through Paul in Ephesus, I believe that you can do a thing like this in this area, Alcoma I believe you can do this thing in Burlington, Greensboro, Brown Summit, all the surrounding areas throughout North Carolina, throughout America, throughout the world. And Father, you have given us the recipe that has worked constantly. But if we would look at these scriptures and see how that you spoke through Paul, and how that through Paul the Word of God went forth and it accomplished what you intended for it to do. But I'm praying today that you would put a holy boldness in all of our hearts, that then the prayer will not be satisfied and we will not be quenched. And so we go out there and new Father, and we lift up Jesus Christ before the people who stand in need of salvation. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you, dear God, for all that you do for us and through us. These things I ask in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. You may be seated tonight, and truly God is in this house, and I feel His presence. I'm thankful for the way that He's already begun to touch my heart. As I said just a few moments ago, Paul now is on another missionary journey. And he went out many times and went out to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to establish churches, and he'd call others to come. And the third position of pastor in churches, he'd move on to another area and start another church there. In this particular passage of Scripture, Paul is on his third missionary journey, and of all places, God now has sent him to Ephesus. At this particular time, Ephesus was one of the wickedest pea places on earth. It was a city that was filled with darkness, with sin, demonic activity. It was a place of superstition. It was a place where fear abound and demonism was on a rampage throughout this whole area of Ephesus. It was a temple that was built there that was considered one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. It was the temple of Diana. And I mean, it had columns and a number of columns all around this magnificent building. Some of the columns were 60 feet high. And I know this is a magnificent thing to behold, but it was a place for immorality reign. And as people would worship as a pagan god, it was an immoral worship service. And it was a place where they could cast spells and do all kinds of things of ungodliness and things against God Himself. And God here is going to send Paul to an ungodly place. And when we think about this, we realize that Paul was facing a spiritual battle. And a lot of people today need to wake up. We need to hear the alarm being sounded. It's the next day, like when Levi was sailing across the sea back during World War II, there would be a certain alarm that would be sounded, wouldn't it, Levi? And it would call for battle stations, and all the sailors would rush to their appointed places and be prepared to fight whatever enemy was coming against them. I believe today that we need to hear battle stations being ranged in our churches once again and for us to realize that we are in a battle. Paul wrote in the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4 and verse number 5, and he was in Corinth at this particular time, and he was writing to Corinth. I mean, he was writing to Corinth from Ephesus, and he was talking about spiritual warfare. So the weapons of our warfare are not criminal. This is why that we spiritually fail in the battles against evilness so often. It's because we try to attack spiritual battles in the planet. We'll never be victorious battling Satan, battling demonic beings, evil spirits, and the flesh. You must battle in the spirit of the Almighty God. And if you will face the battle in the spirit, you will be able to sing the victory song. And I will tell the weapons of our warfare are not cardinal, but mighty to God to the pond down of strongholds. How would you like to go through the area and close down every crack house in Alamance County? How would you like to go through the area and close down all the evil places and all the simple things 
in other area, as I'm telling you tonight, that God has given us the ability through Him to go forth and be victorious in everything that we undertake that is in His perfect will. I also went from Rome to Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12. And in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12, the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's the problem. We don't understand that verse. Because we get that turned around. We think that in the flesh, we are to wrestle in the flesh with everybody else. And you ain't never going to overcome Satan in the flesh. We have to come against him and destroy the power of God. And he, the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Against principalities, against powers. And they underestimate the enemy. And they're powerful. You know they're powerful. Sometimes they're so powerful they become frightening to us. And sometimes they're so powerful that, my goodness, if we're not careful, we'll grow weary of the fight. And sometimes we'll find ourselves retreating, getting into defense, and start by dancing and going into offense. But I also not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. I want to tell you right now, Satan is well organized. He's as well organized as anybody can be. He's got different levels of authority working under him. Many demonic beings into his beck and call. And he's got generals over them, and he's got colonels over them, and majors over them, and, and so forth and so forth. That's what the Bible here is explaining to us in this passage of Scripture. How the purpose is here that they're fighting against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I believe with all my heart we're living in a time when we are so overcome by our wickedness in high places. And I believe I could talk right there, and I believe I could preach for fair of hell on the spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a lot of things that are going on today that should not be going on. And there's a lot of things here that you cannot categorize it any other way but saying that it is wicked. It is wickedness in high places. But Paul wrote to them, and he is telling them about the warfare. He is telling us about the battles that should be fought. So my goodness, what did it take for Paul to be able to reach the people of Ephesus, this evil place? This place who worshipped many pagan idols. This place where the temple of Diana, their pagan god, had built this tremendous worship center, this monument, behind the very town, and people would come there from all over the world to worship. You know what it's going to take, and Paul said the same thing that it's going to take today. Let's look back now in the book of Acts, chapter number 19, and let's look at verse number 8. And we're going to find out exactly what the Bible says that it's going to take in this day and time in which we live in to see evilness defeated and to see righteousness once again restored. We've been discussing in the deacons' meeting, and I don't say anything about the deacons' meeting, but this is a wonderful thing to share with. We are concerned with the body of believers concerning the wickedness that has come and taken over this nation for the most part. I mean, you don't have to be able to see very clearly, but you ought to be able to see enough to know that there is a wicked presence in this land. What's it going to take to overcome the wickedness that's in this land? Well, Paul here says that he went into the synagogue. Now, that would be a tremendous undertaking as it would, as, as you can imagine. Because the Jewish people as a whole rejected Jesus Christ. There were many Jewish people that were being saved. There were 3,000 there in Jerusalem at Pentecost that were saved. Many other thousands had been saved as well. But there were thousands going right into their church, right into their place of worship, and he's beginning to preach to them. But what is he preaching to them? The Bible here says that when he went into the synagogue, he spoke boldly. You don't know how we got to have today with some preachers with some backbones. So we got to have some preachers today that will stand up and say, Yes, say it, the Lord. There are some things that are right, and there are some definitely things that are wrong. There are things that are pleasing to God, and there are some things that are an abomination to God. I don't pretend to be politically correct, and I doubt that I'll ever be politically correct. I'm just going to stand with God, stand with God's Word, 
Because if everybody thinks well of me, it must be that I, I ain't preaching the whole Word of God. Because I'm telling you, those things in that book, it's going to hit me straight in the face. And if you're a human being like I am, there's a lot of things in that book when it's preached, I ain't going to like it either. But it doesn't matter. You get up and preach. But when you preach the Word of God, when you go out and teach the Word of God, when you become bold and you get face to face and you try to start persuading people, friends, I'm telling you right now, people are not all going to accept it. The Bible there says that when divers, divers were hard, <laughs> the little divers meant many, many, many of them, many people, but when many people were hard, there's a lot of hardened people today. I, I want you to know something. There was lost people that walked out of their service this morning. I mean, the gospel, I don't know that anybody can put it any clearer or any simpler. But there's people I know that are lost. I've witnessed to them. I've told you this many times over. I've talked to you. I know you. I know what your response I know how you, uh, what you're counting on for salvation. Everybody left. There's a lot of people that left. And the one reason why it's not penetrating your heart is you harden your heart. You believe Dr. Doolittle instead of believing the Word of God. Because what somebody else has told you instead of the truth. A lot of people are fighting their heart and believe not. I'm sad by that, and it hurts my soul. But to know I know there's people, but if there's some people that died this week, I'm telling you right now, as far as I know, they're lost. And they're not going to call me to do a funeral. And how can you do a funeral if somebody's not one of the hardest things you ever have to do? You can't let them preach them into heaven, and I'm not going to attempt to. I'm going to try to comfort the family. And I hope that the family gets saved and stuff like that. But friends, I'm here to tell you right now, we're living in a time when the Lord gets preached. There's a lot of people who hurt their heart and they're not going to believe. And the heart literally means stubborn. You don't know any stubborn people, I'm sure. But there's a lot of stubborn people, spiritually speaking, that will not believe. And when you find a group of people who have hurt in their hearts, and they won't believe that's what they're going to start doing. That's a nice little bit, bit on that verse there. What are they going to do? They're going to start speaking what? They're going to talk about what? By the way, you know how Christians were called before they were called Christians? By the way, by the way, so those that have hardened their heart and they're not going to get saved because they've hardened their heart, they're going to have stepped over that the ground. How many people can do that? I know God can reach out to people, and I know God wants everybody to be saved, but I believe there's people that sometimes cross the line. That's just about I believe there's people that cross the line sometimes, and God says, all right, I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried, and I've done everything I know what to do, but you just don't want to be saved. All right, you go your way, and I'll go my way. God, and they've hardened their hearts, and they believe not, and what do they do? You think they just sit around and be pacified? Pacifist? No, they go around and they start speaking evil. Christianity. Has anybody been hearing that lately? There have been a lot of speaking and a lot of things that are being heard today that is against the way. I mean, they uphold all the pagan different things. But you go out there to put their game in play. You stand and point up in the sky over something that God's allowed you to do, but they'll crucify you. But they began to speak evil. Well, they were giving Paul a fit, and anybody that followed Paul, they'd give them a fit. And they'd be going around before the multitudes, and they'd be speaking evil about it. But they don't worship God. Eh? They don't worship our faith in God. They think there's only one God. There can't be one God. I hear over winter say that. There can't be but just one God. I've heard that you've had two praise those on so many. There can't be but one God. There's got to be more than one God. Because I'm telling you right now, the part of multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing those in the school of one Tyrannius. Now, this school, the Tyrannius that was running at that particular time, they would go to about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and then they'd be let out. Because in Ephesus, they would have a siesta time. Is that what you're going to do? Take a nap. A siesta time. They're not they rest. He did the day. They rest. And so Paul goes over there and he, he, he deals with those. And he gets to use this 
in this house of the school, the study hall, whatever it is, because Corinthians is there teaching up to about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, but they don't come back to about maybe 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So when people are really not working and doing anything, they're trying to beat the heat of the day, Paul was holding church. That's what people started doing when they weren't having to be at work. They started coming to church. And they started hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul went there daily at that time, and he continued to preach to them and to teach them the wonderful things of God. But he not only stayed there three months, but just ran for a period of two years. And God began to work, and God began to move in that area. And I've seen God move in this area, nothing short of great miracles. Who would ever thought that God would have blessed this area with such a revival that God blessed us with after the summer? Thousands of people were saved. Thousands and thousands of people come and sit out in the heat, rain, storm, whatever, because that's a miracle. That's a miracle. God said, I'm not done with you yet. God said, I've got plans for you. And God blessed us in many ways, not only with just a revival, but God has blessed us in many wonderful, wonderful ways. And God used miracles during the times of Paul and Ephesus. I want you to know God uses miracles today. God's the, I tell you, if we would beg as much about God's healing as we beg about some football team, some basketball team, if we as we I have spoken about how good God is to us as well about some restaurant. How far do you think that would go? How do you think God would bless that? God's done a lot of miracles. I know He's done a lot of miracles in lives here. I know He's cured some people of cancer here. I know He's raised some off the deathbed. I know He has. I know God's answered prayer in many other ways, and there's been many miracles that have been formed. And when, when God does that for us, we ought to be sharing that with other people. We'll be telling people that. We should. But we're not telling people like we should. We're, we're not sharing the wonderful things. But God did wonderful miracles there. Uh, that's good to, I mean, some unusual miracles. Look at verse number 11 through verse number 12. Paul did something marvelous there. Verse number 11, verse number 12, the Bible there says, And God wrought special miracles. I don't care if it's special. Well, anytime God answers my prayer, I feel like He thinks I'm special. Anytime God answers your prayer, I want you to know something. You're special. God did it just for you. Amen? Especially what you needed with the hour that you needed. And the Bible says that they wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from his body was brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. You know what that's really telling us? That they were sending around and uh, they were taking and using that and God was using it to heal people. Oh, sweaty, sweat rags. Paul oh, worked and he'd sw- he send that out to somebody and if they had a disease and be cured by filled with demonic beings, the demons would have to leave. Well, that's not man. But how did God change emphasis around? He changed it with bold preaching. He changed it with a bold preacher. He changed it when people, when, the, when, the, when, the, when God's man would get up and continue to uh, preach three months, two years, whatever it took to get the job done. God was on the side there as well, doing great things. And I want to tell you, there's a great transformation beginning to take place there. When I look at verse number 15, verse number 16 there, and Acts chapter number 19, when I look at that passage of Scripture there, I'm seeing here that, they, that he was able to deliver people from evil spirits. Now, I know a lot of people today never even heard of demons. I grew up in church. I really did. I went to Sunday school. My mom did make sure I was there. But you want to know something? I've never heard about a demon. Never heard about a demon. I mean, I, I went to church when I was about 16, 17 years old, and I didn't even know such a thing as this. Demon. I remember skipping uh, up there, and we went to a movie there, and Shirley hadn't even come to Salisbury yet, and it was called The Exorcist. I'm telling you, that song still sends chills up my back. I mean, I sat there, we snuck in, me and a bunch of my friends, we looked way over, but we snuck in there in Charlotte, and we sat there, good night. You talk, I never heard anybody being possessed by a demon like that. I mean, I wasn't afraid of somebody jumping out of the screen. I wasn't afraid like that. I, tell you, I was afraid that there was such a thing as a demon. Just so happens we had a Catholic boy with us. One of my best friends. 
we got back in the car, and I said, you know, I ain't never heard tell of anything like this. He said, oh, yeah. He said, we've got special priests in our, in our church that goes around, and uh, they deal with demonic people. I said, I ain't never heard of that. He said, that's real. He said, it's real. It's real. Demonic things are real. And I don't you know where you believe it or not. Demonic beings, evil spirits are real. The Bible here says that God has a lot of demonic spirits. You, what, what would it be like if God get rid of some of these demonic spirits that are ruling the world today? I was thinking, I couldn't, I can't, I can't understand it. Things like that. Little boy in the elementary school that got shot and killed. We discussed that. I, I, we were discussing that with somebody. How could anybody do it? I don't care how to do it. They're demonic. Nobody in their right mind can go in and do such a horrible thing as that. Demonic. I believe sometimes you can follow a certain name of them because they're always doing the same thing. Following through the newspapers, following through. Different things like that. You'll see something happen down here, and then you'll see a demon duplicated somewhere else. See, when a demon does something through somebody, he can leave that person holding the bag, or that person can be killed. That demon doesn't die when that person dies. That demon just leaves. Them. That's the Bible. And then that demon goes somewhere else looking for another place or another person that they can go in and control. And then that demon will go about doing these different things. I know that demonic activity is true. Jesus faced it in his day, and we're facing it today, and we're not going to be victorious until we get to the place and realize that we're in a warfare and that demons are real. Now, demons know a lot and are capable of doing many things. First of all, let's look at verse number 15. What does the Bible there say? And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. Now, first of all, whew, I'm thinking about the extra. What does that verse tell me first? First of all, it tells me that demons can speak through people. You can get it? You ever heard somebody speak in an evil, evil voice? A demonic voice? Does that make sense? Demons, the Bible, is that what? I'm not making that up. The evil spirit answered and said, Now see these, they were exorcists in Ephesus, and they made a living by going around and casting out demons. There were people in Ephesus that made a living by uh, doing astrology and doing fortune telling and all the different things like that. And these guys, seven of them, they were exorcists. And they seen how that God was empowering Paul to cast out evil spirits out of people. So they felt like they could do it. And so they felt like, well, all we got to do is we just got to go and mention the name of Jesus, and that demon's got to leave. Those seven preacher boys go, and they confront some man that is possessed by demons. And they use the term in Jesus' name. I want to tell you, there's power in the name of Jesus. But a lot of times, if this comes from somebody who don't even know Jesus or believe in Jesus Christ, and this is what the response was from that evil person. Now, was it he speaking in his human ability, or was it the demon? The Bible says the evil spirit. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I don't know. Jesus, I know. And that word know there is different from the next word know. That word know. Jesus, I know. The evil spirit said, Jesus, I know. That means they know him all the person. Remember where demons come from? They know the Son of God. They know Jesus exists. They know it was true. They have dealt with Jesus probably many times throughout his earthly ministry and maybe throughout all of history. They have dealt with demons. But I know this Jesus. Then he goes on to say, this demon speaking again from this person says, Oh, I know. That word know there is not as quite as strong a word as the word when it says, Jesus, I know. But Paul, I know. And they're saying, basically, the word know there says, We're acquainted with Paul. We've heard about Paul. But then look at what the demon said. 
But who are you? Who are you? I know Jesus. I know He's real. That's what we're knowing. Me. We're going to Paul. We're acquainted with Paul. But who are you? And you know how the story goes. The Bible tells us that one possessed person beat the daylight out of seven other preacher boys who thought that they could go out and do the same thing that Paul was doing in the Spirit of God. They were trying to do it in the flesh. And they were for the wrong reason. And that one man that was possessed beat the daylight out of him and sent him home crying. And what else does that tell me about somebody's possession? They're strong, aren't they? Physically strong. What about the maniac of Gadara? Does not the Bible say that no man can tame him? Doesn't the Bible say that feathers couldn't hold him? That means chain shackles. They couldn't hold him. He'd break him. A demonic person that is physically stronger, a demonic person can speak to you through a human body. A demonic person, a demonic being can speak to you. A demonic being can empower the person that they are possessed and so forth and so on. So, is it any, any process of having a demonic person to go and do such a godly thing? Not to me. There's no question at all. None whatsoever. Friends, I'm here to tell you right now, our demonic powers are real. I'll tell you how that man leaped over and beat the daylights out of all seven of them. My goodness. It is time for us to get battle stations. After that demonic being beat the daylights out of seven for ten preachers, it began to cause a revival, a stir in Ephesus. It really does. It begins by uh, telling us in chapter uh, number 19, verse 18, verse number 19. The Bible tells us there that many people began to believe in Jesus Christ. Many people become uh, 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 serious about their spirituality. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, verse 18, and many that believed came and they confessed and showed their deeds. Many people come. It's hard to do that. It's hard to get people to stand up for Jesus. It really is. But here the Bible is telling us clearly in this passage of Scripture, and many that believe that it came and confessed. You want to know something? Confession is made with the mouth. But if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. And he showed their deeds, and they confessed their lives. Now listen to verse number 19 of Acts 19. The Bible there says, Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That makes a lot of money in that day. 50,000 pieces of silver. But all these people had all these books on divination, all these books on astrology, all these books on witchcraft, all these books on spells, all these books on and all these different uh, pagan worship idols. And when God finally reached down and touched the city of Ephesus, and many people began to believe, the Bible says that those people come forth and started confessing their faults, and they come forth and they started telling that they were believers, and they got those things out of their life. It has been hindering them. And I believe today the church has got too many things in our lives that are hindering us. There's too many things that we have considered not to be that bad of an influence on us, but they are. There needs to be a house cleaning. There needs to be a soul searching. We need to get back to the times like God says and take this thing seriously. And we're not going to take it seriously until we find some people, some men that are willing to stand up and boldly proclaim the truth. Boldly come face to face with people and persuade people that this is what God says. And God hasn't changed. God is the same today. He has always been. And when they come forth and they burn us, listen to me. I believe by my heart that there's time when the Lord begins to use certain things. 
Apparently they can use astrology. I'm saying it right now. Apparently they can use fortune tellers. Well, it's getting mighty quiet out there. And I don't see very many people here. Yeah. I see people hardening their hearts. I'm telling you right now, you don't have a place in your life for God and for all this fortune to come and pop up and read and tear it apart, <coughs> witchcraft, spells and charms, and all these different things there. And demonic activity is associated with all these things. God, as a matter of fact, tells us to leave them all alone. I believe that. Matter of fact, and this is not on the overhead of there, Randy, but if you were to look back in your Bibles in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, you'll see, beginning with verse number 9 of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse number 9, the Bible there says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now, God is saying this is an abomination. Now, what is an abomination? Let's read what verse number 10 says of chapter number 18 of Deuteronomy. The Bible there says, They shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. But again, when I look at that passage of Scripture, I believe with all my heart that one of the main, one of the main goals of Satan is to destroy young people. I believe abortion is nothing but birth from Satan. Destroying babies, destroying children, destroying helpless beings. Because I believe there's probably been times that God may have sent us answers to our problems and cures to our diseases. But we live in a time when we have sat so silently by and we've allowed millions upon millions of millions of babies to be murdered. God may have sent the cure to cancer. God may have sent the cure to diabetes. God may have sent the cure to all things. We may ask God. We may ask God. He'll answer our prayer. But we may have sent it. But we may have been killed in the world. So there's always attacking children. When Jesus was born, Satan came to wipe out all the born children there in Bethlehem. When Moses was born, Satan came to wipe out all the born children there in Egypt. There would come a time when people, when they worship all these pagan gods, they would literally, they couldn't see that, I couldn't do this, but they would take their precious little babies and to worship some pagan stone statue. They would throw that baby into the valley of some iron cast like bull that was filled with fire and coal, and they'd send that baby in there so it could kill it down. So they prevail for some of the pagan gods for blessing. That's demonic. That's the only way somebody can do that by demonic. Activity. And should not be found in any. One that make of his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. No. One that uses revelations. Spells. If you're having trouble finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend or somebody to marry, Please don't go somewhere and let them give you some kind of special space. You'll wind up with the devil. All that uses domination or an observer of times. I'm going to tell you right now, you already leave this astronomy, astrology alone. I get those two words mixed up. One is a study of the universe, but another one is trying to say it continues. I'm going to just say this. Get mad. That is so dumb. To think that because one planet happens to be so close to a star alignment that it's going to tell you what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Quit wasting your precious God-given money on such crazy. I can't believe people do this. Well, the stars and the sun. Observer of times and an enchanter. Hey, people do that thing. I'm serious. You know what I'm telling you, true? They are a witch. Now, they're witches. Witches are real. I think one of the largest witches school in, in, in the United States is found down here in North Carolina. 
kind of witches are in. Uh, my, my, my wife went visiting one time and her and they went to their house and they actually wound up at a witch's house. And they had stuff on the, in jars and all that stuff around and said, well, look at it. a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, you know, with those that go to the ball. Or a wizard, or a nurse, or a master, and a private call back to the day. Verse 12 says, For all that do these things are an abomination of the people who don't do these things. I'm telling you, 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 I'm What did God use? How did God use Paul to reach Ephesus? Well, I'm telling you, it was so much in the ground, it was not there, so much demonism was in that town, so many pagan worship services were being held there, and all these different things, but God sent Paul in the midst of the fire and sin, and Paul began to preach and preach boldly. He began to face people face to face. All ruffles and feathers, and that's going to happen. It doesn't matter if you preach the word of God. There's going to be some people that are going to speak evil against you. And it might not that they try to speak against what you're saying. They'll try to say they just don't like the way you come to him. They just don't like the way you pray. Or they just don't like this. Or they don't like that. They just want to speak evil about you. Just talk about you. All they have to talk about you. But I'm here to tell you right now, Paul didn't give up. And he kept preaching. And he kept teaching. And he kept preaching. And he kept teaching. God started doing great mighty miracles through him, and God started doing great mighty works. Friends, I'm telling you right now, the Bible says many people turned to God, and they repented in their hearts, they changed their lives, they brought forth all these things that had been hindering them in their spiritual life, they got rid of all the uh, uh, books that were uh, uh, telling you how many spells you could cast, they got rid of them books telling you what kind of witchcraft tactics to use. They got rid of all these different things like that. And the Bible says that the Word of God grew mightily. Friends, that's a picture of what we need in this day and time. Let's stand right here. Bless your hearts tonight. Listen to me tonight. If you're here tonight and you've not been saved, I want to tell you something. You better take me seriously. You're fair game to me. Spirit that wants to come and take control of your life and make it move. Satan can come and take control of your life if you are lost and undone without Jesus if you've never been saved. He even came in and entered into the life of Judas and scared. It don't matter if you're sitting on the church pew. It didn't matter if Judas would have been following Jesus for three years. When Judas uh, started seeking a way to betray Jesus Christ, Satan had come in. The Bible tells us it's not just once, but twice. The Bible says Satan entered into Judas. I want to tell you right now, it's, it's no funny business being possessed by Satan. It's no funny business being possessed by some demon. And you might be possessed by more than one demon. It could be many demons that come and possess you. There's only one thing that can save you and keep you from being possessed, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Because once you get saved, you become possessed not by an evil spirit, but you become possessed by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and possesses you, the Bible tells us clearly that greater is He that is within you than that which is in the world. So if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, why are you taking a chance? Satan may come and, and he may use you for a moment and leave you. A demon may come. He may send a demon your way and that demon might use you. That demon might leave you holding the bag. That demon might cause you to do something that you would have never done in your own in your own mind. You never would have thought it. You would have you would have never attempted it. You would have never done it. But you did. I'm telling you, demons are powerful. There's a lot of things in the Bible that tell us things that they can do. You need to be saved. And going to Maybe tonight God's speaking to your heart. Maybe there's some things in your heart, Christian, tonight. Maybe there's some things in your house, Christian. You that are of the way. You that have belief. Maybe there's some things that's hindering your spirituality. 
I believe with all my heart that the demons and the devil, sometimes he can use all kinds of different things. I remember back in the 70s, there was a song that was sung, and I like all, like all kinds of songs and music. I did. There was one song I really liked. I don't know if y'all remember it or not. If I, I don't know, I'm going to say, Stay Away to Heaven. Stay Away to Heaven. Back in the 70s, early 70s, y'all remember it? Stay Away to Heaven. I went to a friend of mine's house. We heard this, but we didn't believe it. But it turned out out of an old record. Old. They call it Back Master. Back Master. If you sit there and you take your finger and start rotating that album back. No, I don't think you had to turn it over. You played it on the same side. I don't think I had to you know, you get my But anyway, you started playing the back. I sat there and I looked at this. I'm a witness to it. It started saying, I love Satan. 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 There's things that the devil can use. And you might not think it's a bunch. But whatever it is that you got in your heart, Search our hearts and our souls tonight, Almighty God. Whatever there's anything in my heart right now, dear God, should not be. I want you to point it out. I want you to get over it, Almighty God. I want to ask you to forgive me of it. I want you to hear the Father and not allow it to hear the truth of God. We're going to pray the same thing for every, every person here tonight that believes. It was those that believed that brought their books of divination. It was those that believed that brought that which was hindering them. They didn't want it no more. They didn't want it in their house no more, God. They didn't want nobody else using it. They burned it. They didn't want it to fall in somebody else's hands. They destroyed it. God, I believe your churches today need to have a bonfire. I believe there's some things that need to be destroyed. There's some things that need to be taken out of our lives or we need to get out of our lives. It's hindered. God, you have your way. Your will be done for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Is there anyone that needs to come tonight? Is there anyone God speaking to? God's touching your heart. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe there's some things in your heart. Maybe there's some things you know about. Maybe there's some things you don't really know about. Maybe there's some things that kind of be a little bit questioning. Well, should I do this? Should I do that? Why don't you come and ask God? Why don't you come and ask God? Here's Linda praying. Now, here's somebody else coming. Don't pray with Linda. Don't pray with Linda. God speaking to anybody else's heart tonight. You ready? You ready to beat? Are you, know, you ready to beat the devil? Get on. I'm telling you right now, you don't know what you're going to face before this week is over. I'm telling you right now, you're being blessed and you're happy in the Lord's prayer. Watch out, bro. Satan can't stand that. He's going to come and try to knock you out of the saddle as sure as I'm standing. You better be ready. Get ready. Get ready. You need to come tonight.
My Heavenly Father, you truly have been good. Lord, you have blessed us. And God, we're thankful for your presence. We pray, God, you continue now to go with us on 